Hello, everyone, and welcome to our How College Students Succeed author webinar. My name is Patty Webb, and I am the Marketing Manager for Stylus Publishing. Stylus webinars bring you direct access to our authors and their latest titles. Today, I'm happy to introduce Nick Bowman, Becky Weiling Packard, and Yosipa Roxa of How College Students Succeed, Making Meaning Across Disciplinary Perspectives. This book will be published by Stylus in April 2022, so we are happy to give you all a special preview today. How College Students Succeed brings together extensive knowledge on college student success. It includes seven chapters from authors who synthesize the literature from their own field of study. Each describes the theories, models, and concepts they use, summarizes the key findings from their research, and provides implications for practice and policy. Nick Bowman is the Mary Louise Peterson Chair in Higher Education at the University of Iowa. He is also a Senior Research Fellow in the Public Policy Center and direct director of the Center of Research on Undergraduate Education. Becky Weiling Packard is professor of psychology and education, as well as former associate dean of faculty, founding director of teaching and learning, director of leadership, and senior advisor for STEM initiatives at Mount Holyoke College. And Yosipa Roxa is the professor of sociology and education, as well as senior advisor to the provost and Director of Strategic Academic Programs in the Office of the Executive Vice President and Provost at the University of Virginia. So without further ado, I will hand it off to the editor of How College Students Succeed, Nick Bowman. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, so we really want to, um, so thank you all for coming today, both those who are joining live and anyone who's watching this video um, later. Um, we'd like to start off by seeing um, who's here uh, participating and we want to do so actually in a way that's consistent uh, with the theme of the book. So Patty, actually, if you could share the first uh, poll that we have. Um, so you'll see a poll asking about the sorts of uh, degrees that you might have. Um, this is also set up so that if you have degrees in multiple areas, you can select uh, more than one. Um, and so please feel free to go do that. I realize that not everything is going to be covered here um, in this particular list. Um, also, you might note and like, oh, why are those organized in those ways? But part of the reason is actually it's done in a way that aligns with some of the chapters um, that we have in the book, which is why some of these are more narrow, some of these um, are more broad. Um, so please, and maybe give a few more seconds for that, um, and then Patty can share the results with us to see who we have here. So not surprisingly, we have a lot of people with higher education degrees, um, but we have quite a good representation and um, in other fields as well. Um, and this is also fun creating these categories that if you ever try to be like, oh, who is a STEM student? Um, that is an interesting exercise um, as well. So thank you all coming in. Part of this is also to illustrate just the heterogeneity and how we've been trained um, as we approach and think about issues um, with student success. Um, so basically, part of the reason why this book started out is um, I was working on another book a few years ago um, on how college affects students. Um, and so I was in charge of taking the lead on the educational attainment and persistence chapter. And so, you know, to review like a whole bunch of literature, you know, hundreds of studies, you know, on, on that topic. And so at first we started with a keyword search where we typed in things that were hopefully gonna get us to the right studies. And we got some good stuff, but it was just so much of a smaller slice than we had expected. And it was really noticeable that the things that we found tended to be within like, you know, journals that I would consider higher education journals, you know, the places that, you know, some of us who identify with that uh, training, you know, might publish in. And so then, you know, we're like, okay, well, we certainly need more than this and started working and, you know, go looking back who was cited in those studies we have, you know, then also seeing who cited the work that we have um, moving back. And then all of a sudden we did that. And there were these whole other fields of literature, um, a couple of which are going to be represented here on this call that all of a sudden, you know, we were able to access, you know, and that those people tend to cite one another and have, you know, their own interesting dialogue on topics that were relevant, um, but not always in communication with one another. And I've seen this in other systematic reviews as well, where, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, here's someone, these authors from this background, and I know these other eligible studies that might get in there, but depending on how you go about it, you might just not know, like, what is happening here. Um, so this book is an attempt to bring what we know about college student success all together in one place. Um, so as a quick overview, um, the, the beginning kind of main chapter actually talks about 
what are some recent student success interventions that have been noted in Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle of Higher Ed um, to get an overview of, you know, what's some of the new stuff that's gaining attention here. Um, there are then seven chapters um, that focus on a particular discipline, field of study, um, or perspective on this. Um, then toward the end, we attempt to synthesize this work by creating an interdisciplinary theory of college student success and then wrap up with discussing a variety of different implications um, for that. Um, so today in this webinar, we intentionally are not seeking to try to give you an overview of everything that appears in the book. Um, so instead, what we've done is we've invited, um, we have three of us who have written uh, those seven, three of the seven chapters um, on here or who have been co-authors on those chapters. Um, and we're basically going to give, you know, sort of a taste of what's involved in that, how these chapters are similar and different from one another. Um, and we hope to have plenty of engagement um, with all of you um, and with one another. Um, so before we jump into the first one, uh, Becky is going to talk about uh, STEM education. So if we can get the second poll um, posted up, um, which gives us a little sort of segue into that. Um, it's worth noting uh, this poll is asking specifically about um, STEM issues at your particular institution. You know, depending on your role, you may or may not be familiar with these issues at your institution. Um, you also may or may not work at a college or university, in which case um, this poll would be less relevant. Um, but hoping, you know, for those of you who are knowledgeable about this, you know, and for whom the question is relevant, can type in, you can choose any number of these different issues here, including all of them, if all of them are relevant to you. All right, as I expected, there are a lot of different you know, issues of relevance here, um, which is interesting. Um, so I, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Becky. Great. Well, it's so great to be here. And thanks so much, Nick. And thanks so much, Stylus and Patty and everyone um, for your interest in student success and just being part of this project has been wonderful. And, I'm glad to share. And as Nick said, I'm just going to give a couple, I do have a couple slides I'm going to share just to give you a highlight, sort of a high level of some of the things you can expect in the chapter that I worked on with Rachel Hurst, my dear colleague in biological sciences at Stonehill College. And we've done a lot of work together, actually on community college transfer alignment in STEM in particular. And so um, it was great to have this chance to, to work together a bit. Um, Let's see. Okay, so we'll just start here with a little bit about what's in the chapter and it's broken down into three parts. Um, think about where and how do we see student success in STEM? And so I'll focus on three areas and this is not, there's, there's so much in the literature and I think that's what was really interesting even just reading some of the chapters in preparation for our conversation today. There, there is so much that I read in chemical education and computer science education and engineering education that maybe Josefa and Nick rarely see, you know, in the work that they do and vice versa. And so really actually becoming knowledgeable, um, I would argue kind of zooming in a little um, in STEM can help us to zoom out and think more broadly and, and vice versa. So I do shine a light on strategic learning in courses, especially gateway reform. The reason why I do that is because actually a lot of the literature has concentrated here, both at the national level and also for institutional studies that people have undergone reform in these areas and have published in this area. So in terms of where we find the literature and where we see student success. I'll also say much of this literature is actually about attrition and loss. So um, you have to actually look, you have to look sometimes a little harder to see where are the strategies and where are we promoting student success versus, um, you know, it, it seems like many decades ago, we were talking about weeding out students out of STEM and it's still happening. So we're um, looking there and also second, becoming part of a STEM disciplinary community through research. And research is not the only way to become part or become part of that community, but it is a vibrant part of the literature and it's definitely a high impact practice and a way that we see student success. And then the third one I focus on is structural change. And I, in particular, in, in this work in the chapter, 
um, Rachel and I focus on uh, DEI connections. So a lot of the work around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion on campuses and around student success intersect very much in STEM. And we see a historical exclusion of groups of color um, and of low income first gen uh, community college transfer students. And so I take up some of those issues in that the third part of the chapter. And I'm just gonna give you just a little bit more um, from each of those before I cede my time. So the first kind of thinking about that gateway um, course is in a focus on strategic learning. And I am I'm so pleased that Dr. McGuire is in the house and to say, um, yes, there's a lot of focus on your work here and contemporaries who follow and have picked up on strategic learning. One thing really important here that I think you'll see woven throughout the book, but certainly in our chapter is this duality. We both wanna equip students to be strategic learners and we need faculty and classrooms and departments and institutions that scaffold and provide those kinds of supports and um, ways of learning. And so it's really approaching it in that duality about how to support and embed these structures in our courses versus thinking that students will arrive with it. And then if they don't, well, then they're out of luck. Um, there's so much literature here and um, across disciplinary journals in STEM. And so I highlight a number of things from exam blueprints, enhanced answer keys, requizzing, you know, really helping to activate metacognitive knowledge and what that looks like in practice. And so it's, um, there's both the theoretical aspect, the uh, social cognitive and a sociocultural perspective theoretically, and I really dig into some very fine grain, some of the studies to sort of pull those out. And so it's a very rich literature review. Also a focus on active learning and formative feedback. Many people are aware that we should be doing more active learning, but you might not have focused on some of the emergent research that suggests that if not done well, we can actually exclude the very students that we're trying to um, use these practices to be more inclusive and then um, we can actually alienate our either our students of color or LGBTQIA students. And so some of that emergent work is in there. And then some of the work that I've done um, around embedding peer mentors, um, both kind of course-based approaches to help prepare peer mentors to be embedded in chemistry courses, let's say, or in the work that I've done in computer science education. We also have kind of a number of ways of preparing those peer mentors so that they can also help build in that metacognitive, but also a very inclusive and identity um, kind of asset oriented framework. In terms of the section of the chapter that focuses on student success around entering a STEM disciplinary community, I focus on um, a number of different parts around mentored research and all of its forms. And Rachel actually has a rich background in this area. And so it was a really great collaboration of looking and shining a light on the community college undergraduate research um, initiative and thinking about how um, this involves not only building communities of researchers, uh, whether through course-based summer, short-term, um, and other types of methods, but also how we enlist lab instructors to collaborate on their teaching methods, to think together about what we're doing and what is the quality of that mentoring. And um, maybe you've looked at the recent National Academies report on STEM mentoring and really thinking about what that looks like and how to make it more effective, more culturally relevant and kind of mitigating negative outcomes. And last but not least, the third section talk about structural change. And um, here I hi uh, highlight a number of pieces, um, Susan Alrad and Adrienne Kazar's work, um, a lot of work on faculty development and faculty learning communities. Like, like I said, mentioning really strong intersections with um, campus climate, classroom climate, and kind of DEI more broadly and also affordability issues. And there's a number of national initiatives and also local initiatives and really kind of teasing out what are some of the faculty development initiatives that work 
And as somebody who founded our teaching and learning initiative, um, I know that even on a campus like ours, where people are very committed to teaching, you know, faculty development is a long-term process and needs to be done in collaboration in departments and in institutions. And so just to sum up before I pass the baton, um, just kind of what to expect from this chapter, you'll see an investment in students and in the teachers and the curriculum. Um, the studies focus on individual differences, but also patterns of change. And thinking about how we allocate our finite resources strategically and in partnership. And to critically examine our assumptions about who can succeed in STEM, who is succeeding in STEM, and how we may need to rebuild our systems from ground up. And so with that, I will stop And um, just thank you for letting me share that bit. And, and again, just thank Rachel for her great collaboration and the, the many, many authors um, whose work, it's just been a really booming area um, in that disciplinary specific um, student success and educational research more broadly. Great, thank you so much, Becky. Um, I actually have a question um, for you um, to follow up to see, to kind of paint a bit of a picture of, you know, what would, you know, an effective, based on some of this research, like what would an effective classroom look like, um, you know, in a STEM environment? Yep. And I realize that's intentionally a broad question because that may look different depending on whether we're talking yes. larger class, smaller class, with a yes. lab, um, et yes. cetera. I mean, I'll just mention a couple of things. One is, you know, sort of knowing who your learners are and uh, both accessing and activating their prior knowledge. There were some studies that I cite that even just activating knowledge from a prior semester, you know, prior to the course, um, the next course being offered. So you might have a course that's offered in the spring and then the next course is offered in the fall and there's this summer gap between those offerings. And so there's some work about reactivating that knowledge and pointing people to, um, you know, kind of, so, so there's a way that we're bringing them closer to where we're going to be starting the class from. So that's one example of a practice where it's kind of getting to know who your learners are, stepping back a little bit and thinking about kind of sequences. And then um, are we helping to kind of lay out a plan of how to be successful? And does our practice, whether that's our homework or labs, does it align with the kinds of things we're expecting students to do? So there's a little bit of that um, I also think that some of like, what does it look like to be successful are people that do collect their data on how they're, not just how their students are doing in terms of grades, but what is their overall experience? And when we actually see students turning away, you know, in groups and feeling excluded, um, that sometimes we miss that and we can misunderstand underperformance as being something about the student when it actually is about the social context. And so I think student success looks like people examining those assumptions and being in conversation with each other um, around sometimes difficult topics about who has been historically excluded and who is currently still being excluded, sometimes because of our assumptions. And so it's both a cognitive function kind of piece about scaffolding and kind of activating cognitive function. And it's this more strategic kind of alignment in departments um, and in classrooms about what kinds of outcomes uh, align with our values as an institution. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so a couple of things I think in, um, and it's been great as I've seen a couple of citations and other engagement in the chat. So first of all, like, please feel free. So the chat is like, you know, you can use to kind of openly post, you know, we can see that as well as other um, audience members um, on this as well. Um, so we encourage you to do that. At the same time, if you want, there's a Q&A function um, that will go just to um, the three of us um, here as panelists. Um, so you're welcome to use that if you want to engage and ask questions at any point. So we're going to, you know, we're intentionally saving some time at the end um, for some broader group conversation and to engage, hopefully, with your questions that you have um, for us. So we encourage you, you know, the nice thing about the chat is you can put it in and we can always come back to questions later. Um, I also want to segue as we're going to move into talking about the sociology chapter, um, you know, and thinking about because one of the points of this book is to think about like, you know, the similarities and the differences in terms of 
how we approach these, what research questions are asked, what methods are used for exploring these, um, what topics are salient, you know, or perhaps overlooked as a result um, of some of this. Um, yes, there are good shapes. Also, if you want to know more about uh, mentoring, you should look at Becky's stylist book from a few years ago as well. Um, so I want to post this um, here in the chat um, in the spirit of thinking about this. And so we encourage, we were testing the various flavors of Zoom polls earlier, but if you want to use the Q&A to ask us direct, you know, respond to that directly, if you don't want, you know, because you may or may not, you know, there's always this idea in undergraduate classes and beyond of like the, you know, thinking about, well, you know, oh, I, do I have the right answer, you know, as if, and in this case, there isn't necessarily a right answer because different people might have written the same chapter um, in a different manner, but something for you either to share with us or to think on your own, you know, how do you expect that chapter, those two chapters to be different from one another? Um, and part of the, there are actually, well, many reasons that I invited Becky and Yosefa on this. One of them is the differences in the chapters across all three of our chapters. Um, another reason, as you heard before, not only do they have amazing content expertise, but they also both have great experience working, you know, in leadership positions to promote um, student success um, and bring that as well. Ooh, so I think I'm going to hand it off here to Yusupa to talk about um, the sociology chapter. Sure, definitely. I am not seeing many answers to what sociology chapter is going to do. So I may just have to uh, give you my version of what sociology chapter is going to do and how different it is. Um, thank you, Nick, for organizing this, this amazing volume. Uh, it's been um, fascinating to actually read the other chapters. And, and I'm a sociologist by training, uh, but I have an appointment in education school as well. And I work with higher education colleagues um, and I work with Nick's colleagues and other Nick's colleagues as well. And so um, I, I feel like I live on this boundary between various disciplines. But today I'm going to be a sociologist for you. So for the next 10 minutes, um, I only see sociology. And that's what I'm going to share with you in terms of um, how I would characterize sociology seeing the world uh, of higher education and student success. And I am going to see if I can share my screen and get my slides up. There we go. Um, so this is a sociology chapter. Again, it's very different from Becky's chapter, which is kind of summarizing an area of research. This is going to focus very much on the discipline. And um, I'm presenting on behalf of uh, my colleagues as well, Blake Silver and Yapang Wang. So, you know, um, James Dusenberry famously quipped that economics is all about how people make choices and sociology is about why they don't have any choices to make. And while that is a bit of a caricature of the disciplines, I think it captures a certain important aspect of sociology, which is that we focus on structure. Um, it's structure of schooling, structure of society, structure, how different structures are related to each other, right? So, um, Sociology in this space, in particular, thinking about inequality in higher education, we really think about how inequality is embedded in laws, in policies, in practices, um, how it is actually a, inside a fabric of all of our social institutions, including our educational institutions, including schools. Um, and so that focus on structure, I would say, is one key characteristic of how sociology thinks about student success. And the other related one is that our focus is primarily on inequality. So sociologists will rarely ask a general question about you know, what facilitates student success. They will very often ask, what leads to differential success of different groups of students, whether that is by class, by race, or by gender? And if I can. There we go, move it forward. Um, the two primarily, primary uh, disciplinary areas that the chapter reviews, um, and, you know, and Nick pointed out if somebody else wrote this chapter, this might have been written very differently, but you're getting kind of a, a, our version, uh, hopefully a reasonably uh, representative version, but nonetheless, uh, we've selected to focus on kind of two, this, two primary um, frameworks with which sociologists study higher education. And student success in particular, right? So that's kind of a narrow focus on student success, not higher education structure and, and other problems more generally. Um, I should note that both of these tradition, traditions really focus on class uh, because their origins, um, kind of the, the seminal theorists and the seminal works in these areas have been great, have been um, 
focused on class inequality. And so lots of the research really is understanding kind of class or socioeconomic inequality, um, even though there is more and more research on kind of race and gender, but just to kind of give you a preview of what's uh, why that's the case. Uh, so status attainment, a, a, a two minute version of what status attainment is about. This is a simplified version of the famous OED triangle. Um, so status attainment scholars examine primarily the relationships between one's origins, which again, tended to be socioeconomic background, but you can think about race and gender being there as well, education, and then one's destinations, primarily labor market outcomes. And it is that triangle that I would say the mass majority of the research of status attainment uh, is within, right? Um, and that research shows right, that education is the primary mechanism that actually links origins and destinations, right? Which basically means that why students from different backgrounds end up in different labor market situations is in substantial part because of educational experiences that they have. Subsequent work has actually shown that college degree is unique in this triangle. College degree can break the link between the origins and the destinations. What does that mean? It means that for students who have college degrees, or for not students, for college graduates, right, for individuals who have college degrees, there is no association between their family background and their labor market outcomes. Now we see association both at the lower levels of education, so like high school, and at higher levels of education, like the graduate degrees, but not at a college degree level. And so this has prompted, as you might imagine, a lot of research on college degrees. So who gets in and who completes? In that vein, sociologists have kind of looked at two different areas, or at least I would like to highlight two different areas. One is focused on expansion. And so, you know, when we think about policy uh, in a higher education context, we might think about, you know, financial aid, and we might think about funding and um, uh, other policies at a state and federal levels. Um, some sociologists look at those policies, but very few. Sociologists tend to look at policy in a different way and, and primarily focused on expansion. Because the idea is if you expand education, you will provide more opportunities. If you provide more opportunities, you should decrease inequality because more people will be able to access this level of education. That's at least the idea. The reality is very different, but the research shows that is actually not the case. Expansion does not usually lead to decrease in inequality. And we can talk about it later as to why that might be the case. Um, and then, you know, apart from increasing the amount of the, the spaces available um, at the given educational level, in this, case, in this case, college, sociologists really think about also access to different types of educations. So institutional type, lots of research on selectivity, right? So to what extent does selectivity matter for labor market outcomes, but also who gets to go to more and less selective institutions? Um, pathways through college, do students um, delay entry? Do they um, leave and then come back, right? Um, do they reverse transfer? So they're kind of thinking about how the students actually travel through and to notice that those pathways are actually structured. They're not random and there's lots of inequality in who goes through higher education in what way and how it matters for whether they finish a degree and what happens to them afterwards. Um, you know, college major being another example there. Um, and so that's kind of a crash course on status attainment, right? To kind of think about some of the main themes and topics that you will see in this area and, and in the chapter. And then social reproduction is kind of the other way that I would say sociologists tend to look at student success in higher education. Um, and I'll focus in particular on cultural capital because that's a kind of predominant paradigm for thinking about student success in higher education within that broader tradition. And what most of you are probably quite familiar with kind of cultural capital, but nonetheless, I will say that, you know, we think about it as individuals familiarity with the dominant culture, and that includes cultural knowledge, information, linguistic skills, styles of interaction. In educational context, we usually think about it as familiarity with the norms and expectations of educational institutions. So that's kind of when we think about cultural capital, that's uh, what we usually refer to. And the key aspect of this um, tradition, I would say, is that schools are seen as sites of social reproduction. Schools are argued to expect 
and reward specific attitudes and behaviors, primarily the attitudes and behaviors associated with more privileged groups in society. And the schools essentially help to convert that privilege into educational success. The process is invisible and hides inequality, makes it look like meritocracy while it's actually converting one's privileged background into an educational success. That sounds very abstract. What does it actually look like? Okay. So here's just a few examples. What do we say when we say colleges expect certain knowledge? We expect that students know certain things, like what are office hours? We put them on our syllabi, but we rarely explain what they are. There's a movement among faculty to include that and to talk about what they are and why students should come to them and why they're beneficial and what to do when you come to office hours. But you know, just a very simple example that, that those of us who live in a higher education world may take for granted and students may not always know what they are. Uh, norms and expectations, right? Uh, we expect that students uh, are comfortable interacting with authority figures. That includes faculty, deans, and associate deans, various staff members and faculty members across the university that they will ask for help. Um, and that may not align very well with students' experiences before coming to higher education and with their propensity to engage in particular activities and behaviors, right? This is not to say that the doing certain things or not doing certain things is good or bad in itself. It's to say that higher education is built in a way that expects certain kinds of behaviors and rewards those kinds of behaviors. And so students who are not kind of following the script, right, who do not understand a certain language in higher education, or who do not understand the norms and expectations of higher education, they struggle um, simply because we keep that opaque. We expect it, we don't share it, we don't make it visible. Um, and here's, I wanna say that, that because of how this tradition talks about student success, it's oftentimes kind of critiqued for, for advancing deficit thinking. Um, I would say that's a misunderstanding of how sociologists think about inequality in higher education, uh, because the understanding of cultural capital tradition and sociological thinking more generally is really that inequality is embedded in structure. So it's not that something's wrong with the students, it is something's wrong with higher education institutions, right? That higher education institutions are inherently unequal. We build higher education in a way that makes it easy for certain groups of students, particularly advantaged groups of students, whether by race, gender, class, to navigate, to meet the expectations and norms that we have, they know how to do it and they succeed and we leave the other ones out. And so, you know, sociologists do tend to focus a lot on describing those different experiences, experiences of students who know how to navigate the system and those who don't know how to navigate the system, um, but primarily as a way to explain and to account for how is it that we structure a system that advantages some groups over others? Um, again, it's not a strength-based model right? because it is a model that focuses on equality, but one that is embedded in structure. So what do we do <laughs> other than change inequality in society across the board? Uh, sociologists oftentimes have a hard time with, with implication sections. If you read uh, sociological papers, uh, it's kind of challenging to say, what do we do? Because again, the way we think about structures, the answer is, you know, change society, change higher education institutions, get rid of inequality. Well, you can't uh, do that, or at least not very quickly. So um, there are some things we can do in the meantime, while we are waiting for the radical transformation of the world we live in. And um, I put up here a few uh, recent books that I think do excellent uh, job in describing some of the more practical ways and one of the more grounded and what do we do today kind of uh, strategies about how do we change our policies and structures, uh, how do we make things explicit, those norms and expectations that we all take for granted, um, how do we change those norms and expectations, why do we expect certain things, we should ask those kinds of questions, um, and how do we act intentionally as opposed to just expecting that things will happen on their own because students have come to us. Uh, from all kinds of backgrounds and with all kinds of experiences. And so I will, uh, I am out of time and I will end here, but hopefully this at least gives you a small flavor of what sociology um, chapter is about and how sociology chapter that takes on this question of um, success in higher education. Thank you so much. And I'm going to ask you if it's okay to spend a little more time, particularly elaborating on that last slide. 
Um, Because I think it's really interesting, you know, given this sort of emphasis on structure and inequality to think, you know, well, what are the insights that we have, you know, in terms of these substantial forces that lead to this inequality? What would an effective approach look like that would facilitate the success of students from lower income or first gen backgrounds, um, as well as students who hold other minoritized identities? Yeah, thank you, Nick. Uh, Since I ran out of time there at the end, you know, it is... I think sociologists would say, could start where you are and do what you can. That's a, a, a phrase that, that um, other people have uh, shared. And to think, to look around you and think about what's the, what are the changes you can make, right? So Armstrong and Hamilton talk about curriculum, for example. So who gets to be in a particular major? Why do we have so many majors that require applications in certain grades and certain experiences before they get in there? Um, why do we do that? And who do we exclude by doing that? Um, certain programs expect internships. So uh, if you do that, are you providing those internships? Are you expecting the students to rely on their families to, you know, and, the, and their networks to do that? Um, you know, Jack talks in his Privileged Poor book about, you know, do you keep dining halls up open during break? What happens to students who are not, you know, who have to stay there and who do not have other opportunities? Um, what about a work study? Why are our work study assignments typically like working in a dining hall as opposed to doing research with faculty? Um, you know, the, the, why do we make things so opaque, right? Why not make things explicit? Jack in his book, there's this great story about office hours. He said, you know, there was a first generation low income student when asked what office hours mean, basically said there was time for faculty to work in their offices. That's not what office hours are, but if we don't talk about what they are and we don't tell students what they are and why they're there and that we welcome them to come to those office hours, they're not gonna do that. And so, um, you know, intentionality. In higher education, we have so many resources, so many opportunities. Uh, Blake Silva and I wrote a paper calling it do-it-yourself university, but there are all these things available. But the problem is it takes a PhD to figure out how to get to things and how to find things. Um, and so how do we intentionally support our students? How do we embed things into courses? How do we embed things into our curriculum in order to ensure that um, you know, students can find us, can find resources, can find information? And so, so that is you know, kind of a few examples of how we would think about various structures, various policies and practices, but just start looking around and start asking, is it explicit? Is it intentional? And who, would, who does it benefit? And you'll find a lot to work on. Great, thank you so much. Um, and it's actually, I'm gonna remember because there's some, one of the findings in my chapter actually speaks really well to this sort of idea of needing a PhD to figure out like all of the ways in which to, to know resources available, to access them, you know, to have the inclination to do so, um, et cetera. Um, so it's an issue that I'm wondering that you all could either type in Q&A or chat or just think about it yourself. So I wrote a chapter that, um, was intending to figure out, you know, well, what's the research and the literature say about higher education research? Um, I thought it was really interesting in that earlier poll that um, it was actually just over half of uh, people who are here today live had um, a higher education degree, you know, and interesting that almost half did not, um, which I actually think in some way, you know, even though I supposed to say, oh, everyone should get a higher education degree. Like, I think it's great, you know, that they, there are people who are, you know, at least interested in the book, engaging in higher education, um, you know, who do not have that particular form of training. Um, great. So I think I'm actually going to move into the chapter um, slide as well. Um, so this is a chapter that I wrote uh, with Jay Garvey, uh, who's a faculty member at the University of Vermont. Um, it was fun to write it with him as well. He takes a more critical perspective than I do um, on this work, you know, so having both that sort of differences in perspectives across as well. And in fact, actually, I want to come back to this because some of the chapters are organized in, you know, that they are a discipline. Um, I would argue higher education is a field of study that has some um, historical as well as present day context drawing from different disciplines. Um, and then there's also at least one chapter, you know, in which we have critical and pro-structural perspectives as being not quite either of those things, but, you know, a diff particular way of looking um, at issues. 
So then comes the tricky question of what counts as you know, something that would go in a higher education research chapter. Um, and so we defined it in a couple of different ways. Um, the main way is that you know, it appears in the sorts of places where people who do higher education stuff publish, um, whether those are journals, um, books, et cetera. Um, there are also other instances in which people, both Jay and I are housed in higher education student affairs programs. You know, and we'll occasionally write something that's not in the usual sort of outlets for those, you know, but at the same time, we're often doing so, you know, through the sorts of lenses that we're used to uh, using to frame the world. Um, and so as a, that's another way that you can think about, well, who's included in there. Um, so we want to provide an overview of what does theory look like um, in higher education research. I mean, there are a whole lot of theories out there. Um, so instead of picking one theory or a small handful of theories, uh, we really thought it was useful to just talk about types of theories. Um, and in doing so, we drew upon Jones and Stewart's work who looked at um, college student development theories and described you know, what those entailed in terms of different waves. Um, so it's important to note like them, you know, we use this general idea to talk about waves over time that are you know, somewhat correlated with you know, wave one is earlier, wave two is later, but not you know, exclusively defined um, in that manner. Um, so wave one, you know, is focusing broadly on sort of these general role of context and environments, um, focusing on all students. Uh, many of the classic theories, you know, that you might think of um, that were published um, on this work, you know, fall into this wave one as well. Um, you know, there is a fair bit of heterogeneity in this, you know, there's certainly in wave one, there's often more of a focus on four-year institutions, and at least an implicit focus on residential um, institutions. At the same time, that's not true of all theories that we thought belonged in wave one, you know, that there are theories that focus specifically on non-traditional age students, on students at community colleges, um, and students who attend primarily commuter institutions. Um, so wave two um, takes more of a focus. Some wave two theories will focus at all, or uh, talk about all students, but at the same time have an explicit focus on equity and the experiences and outcomes of students who hold at least one minoritized identity. In other cases, wave two theories focus specifically on particular uh, students from particular identities, uh, particular experiences. Um, there's also a lot of times a more explicit focus on some of the heterogeneity in institutional context defined in some things that are easier to point to or label and sometimes things that are a little harder to point to or label. So then how do you summarize all the literature on this topic? So one thing, and I really appreciate, you know, the fact um, that Becky and Yosef's chapter, you know, took very specific lenses at, you know, making sense of, you know, particular aspects that I actually want to talk about a little bit um, as we have time later on. Um, we were trying to get, you know, what is the broad, what do the broad brushstrokes look like? And so certainly here today, we don't have time to talk about all the findings from all of those areas. But I did want to highlight that these are the five buckets um, that we were able, uh, that we thought were best able to describe. And so, you, you know, some of those focus more institutionally, some focus more at the student level and student experiences um, and engagement, um, et cetera. College environments is probably our biggest bucket. Um, this includes um, things that also um, are environments broadly defined. They include the interpersonal interactions that students might have with other students, with faculty, with staff, um, and so on. Um, in some cases, you know, some of our review found the sorts of things that you might expect and that are sort of uh, common knowledge, um, I'll air quote that, um, in higher education. Um, you know, so we found, you know, oftentimes that student supports in the forms of advising and mentoring and other types uh, were effective um, at promoting success um, and at times promoting equity in student outcomes. Um, we also found a lot of what you might expect about college environments. And this is actually, I think, one of the biggest overlaps um, with the previous two chapters that we've talked about here today, you know, both in terms of the nature and quality of those environments being very important, as well as the way in which those environments um, can drive inequities in student experiences and outcomes. Um, at the same time, there were a number of findings that I think go against um, sort of conventional wisdom. Um, so institutional characteristics are, you know, these sorts of broad things like you know, size and type and region. Um, at the same time, there were instances in which institutional characteristics matter, particularly around selectivity and whether attending a two-year versus a four-year institution. But in a lot of cases, these broad characteristics when accounting for other institutional characteristics um, had little or no relationship uh, with success outcomes on the whole. Um, there were more uh, pronounced ones if you're looking at specific policies and practices that institutions uh, might implement. 
Um, and at the same time, some of these actually go against conventional wisdom. Um, so there's a couple of salient ones, um, you know, the idea of placing students um, in developmental education if they're perceived as not being ready to do college level coursework in a particular course. Or among students who are already there, you know, taking college courses, your GPA falls too low, you know, you're placed on academic probation. Um, in both of these cases, these could be construed as efforts to get students back on track, uh, to engage in a meaningful manner, you know, and have them succeed. And unfortunately, the best available research suggests that as these are commonly implemented in colleges and universities, they can have the exact opposite effect, that placing students on probation um, or on de into developmental education can actually harm uh, retention and persistence. Um, the final bucket, looking at high impact practices, there's really a mix there um, in positive and non-significant findings. Um, in some cases, these findings are difficult to reconcile, but one that I really wanted to highlight there is the importance of bundling things you know, in the high impact practice bucket, as well as the student, su uh, the student support bucket, um, and integrating these into a more cohesive program um, et cetera, so that students don't have to go around looking for all the support or wondering like, oh, well, if I go to tutoring, does that mean that I'm not smart enough? Um, you know, and I, you know, only like the people who are really struggling go to do that. You know, how can you create these broader programs that say, well, no, this is just what, you know, students tend to do. And here, we're gonna make it really easy for you because we're gonna provide this in the context um, of a program and perhaps even require, you know, some of these forms of engagement. Um, and a lot of these sorts of programs are the ones that tend to be most effective. Um, so implications, not a lot of time to talk about them. Um, just as one thing to point at this first bullet point here, that there was a meta-analysis that explored nearly 200 studies of the quantitative relationship between participating in a first year seminar and retention to the second year. So that's a good example of we know a lot about that and, and really we actually don't necessarily know the, the answer for when that's most effective, you know, or how to do that well, you know, and at the same time, there's lots of other research, you know, that people, you know, could move toward um, in order to, you know, explore more important topics. I mean, not, not to say that's not an important topic, but other topics um, for which we just have less inquiry, explore those in different ways to get additional nuances. Um, I also think it's important as well. Um, I mean, some of my work recently has started looking at academic probation is this thing that colleges and universities tend to have policies around um, you know, and they've been there for a long time and there's a standard way of doing things, um, but do we need to actually reconsider, you know, what, what we've been doing for a long time, you know, and I think some of that really being able to draw upon institutional data to see like in our particular way of implementing this practice or policy, like what is its impact on student success and equity. Um, it's also important as well that, you know, as you think about the things that have the strongest um, evidence for having lots of impact. Um, that they really need to involve collaborative efforts across people working in different units and departments um, on campus. You know, if you create those comprehensive programs, you know, you work to, you know, figure out how financial aid works in combination with some of other policies and practices, um, that this really requires um, collaboration, working together, you know, and some strategic thinking as to how to best promote outcomes. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. All right, and I see that there are Q&A questions and um, other things. And actually, there's some interesting questions um, about smartness and competency um, that I might hand to Becky. Um, I, the social psychology chapter, by the way, deals very directly um, with some of these uh, types of issues. Um, actually, Becky, do you want to uh, respond to that one? Um, and Aris, so basically, the question is asking, is there a need to reframe smartness and competency? to better support students and address retention issues. There's so much, there is so much on that. And as you said, in the other chapter, I think there's like a little bit of treatment in the STEM chapter, but that this kind of endorsement of brilliance or of a more fixed mindset, you know, approach, you know, also kind of aligns with the lack of use of certain kinds of active learning or other kinds of interactive, it, sort of if you believe that um, you're trying to be rigorous, by seeing who just can read your mind about how, what you know how to um, learn this discipline as a newcomer, then um, there really isn't a, a big role for faculty to play, you know, to provide those scaffolds and to um, you know to change the pedagogy. At the same time, I would argue though that departments are not always resourced to do this work well, 
And I think that's what's hard. There's sort of a sense that we need to be more supportive of students. We need to be more student-centered. And to go off what um, Dr. McGuire has in there, I was just starting to write a response, but I'll just speak it. Um, what does that mean to be strength-based versus deficit-based? And I think it's this idea that Yosefa brought up about where's the locus of responsibility? How much do we believe the institutions and departments need to change where we're starting from and what we assume and how much of the problem lies in the student? And I think there's just been, it's been very long standing around um, what smartness is and how that actually is replicating privilege. And I know a lot of the data analytics right now that people are saying, we just take the zip code of the student and we can predict how they're gonna do in the first year in all their classes. We don't even have to imagine there was no instruction. And so what does that really say? And I think that's, we see that really magnified in STEM. And so I guess what I think about a strength base is that when a student arrives in our class, we see their identities as assets. And it's a lot of what I've written on, um, whether we are an advisor, an academic advisor, whether we are an instructor, um, sometimes we focus so much on the barriers and challenges that students will face that we actually see their identities as um, we don't value what people bring to the table. And it's more about the problems they're going to encounter. And some of the problems are because our institutions or our, our classes are not flexible enough to meet students where they are. And I think that that's the piece on the strength base that um, I think is very important. But I think it's hard to know how do how are we simultaneously strength based and recognizing that students need support. So it can be both and, I think. And there is some very important pieces in there that you raise, um, anonymous attendee, about um, smartness and kind of people thinking they're upholding rigor. But when you really analyze who's getting filtered out, or does that align again with our, in, our commitments? And I think that's something where we have to look really hard. Go ahead, Yosefa. And I, I see um, uh, Dr. McGuire actually added a comment in there in response to what you were saying. It's hard to monitor like chat and Q&A in a conversation. I have to say, this is like multitasking on steroids here and I'm not good at it. But, um, you know, I, I think you're right in the sense that that we don't want to pretend like everybody has had the, the same experience and everybody has had uh, the same privileges when they come to higher education. There's a huge variation. But per Becky's point, and you know, I, I work a lot with, with our faculty, uh, particularly in STEM these days, to think about, okay, what do we do about it, right? So yes, correct. Students come into our higher education institutions from very different backgrounds because they've gone to different kinds of high schools, they've had different kinds of neighborhoods, they have different kinds of opportunities before they came to us, right? There was 18 years of life before they came to us. And we can't just ignore that and now pretend like, you know, this is a new chapter. And so, so it's really to me to kind of what's the strength based versus the deficit based. The deficit based to me is to say, okay, yes, students, you know, certain students have come into higher education. Cal let's say calculus because that's the, you know, the thing everybody struggles with in STEM. Um, and, you know, those who are good and smart are going to do well. And those who are not good enough at calculus and not smart are not going to do well. That's a deficit way of thinking where the strengths based way of, way of thinking is, okay, yes, yeah, students have different levels of preparation based on the experiences they've had before they came to us. So what are we going to do about that, right? How are we going to help them um, to learn and to grow, to assume that all of the students can actually learn and grow. But the question is how do we provide them with resources, right? And so I think it is a question and a challenge, right? We don't wanna just pretend like there's no inequality in the world. There is huge inequality in the world and students come to us as unequal packages because of what they've done before. But then the question is, do we just blame them for where they were born, which wasn't their fault, right? And the experience that they had before, or do we kind of take an onus on ourselves to say, um, yeah, they'll, they might, you know, they might not have had a good math prep, but they might be gritty. They might be very creative. They might be, they might have all kinds of other skills and abilities, and we can leverage those for them to learn math and anything else. Thank you so much. And I realized that we are almost out of time now. Uh, that seemed to go quickly, um, at least for me. So so I actually want to share a bit because, again, we only had the opportunity to share three of the seven chapters. And I, I don't think I mentioned earlier, but part of the reason why the chapters are the way we are is that we wanted to maximize the amount of content that was covered while at the same time minimizing overlap. 
Um, so that's why, for example, that there's a social psychology chapter because you know the STEM chapter included you know a fair bit of cognitive and educational psychology in it, and so we didn't necessarily want that same content to appear um, in two different places. Um, so in terms of thinking about practical next steps, um, I want to talk about um, resources from the College Transition Collaborative, which is a group of social psychologists of whom Mary Murphy is one of the authors of the social psychology chapter. She's also uh, one of the founders of this organization. They've done some really great work trying to think about how can you take these sorts of perspectives and implement them in a very practical way, um, both in classroom contexts, policy contexts, um, working directly with students, um, advising and counseling and so forth. Um, and so I wanted to share just this link here in the chat um, that you can go. And so there's actually several buckets of things that you can go into and explore, which I think um, they came out with this a few months ago and has been incredibly helpful um, resource to have some practical tips for how might I, if I'm teaching a course, how might I structure my syllabus in a way to promote um, a positive and adaptive mindset for students to succeed and to um, think about um, any sorts of obstacles or failures that they might encounter in a way that's going to not derail them. Great. Well, I think I'm going to hand it uh, back to Patty here to wrap up. Okay. So thank you to our editors for sharing their time and presenting with us today. Thank you to everyone who tuned in live with us today on Zoom. If you are interested in ordering uh, how college students succeed, use code HCSS25 to get 25% off the book and free shipping from Stylus. I will share that link and code in the chat bar. The webinar video replay will be available by this Friday and shared on all of our Stylus social media feeds. Also be sure to check out our webinar calendar for more author Zoom events this spring. Um, everyone who is registered for this event will get a follow-up email with all of these links and codes. Um, so be prepared uh, to receive that by Friday as well. If you have any feedback on this webinar or any requests for future webinars, please feel free to email us directly at stylusinfo at styluspub.com. And thank you again for everyone who to join us today and have a great afternoon.